Welcome to the flipped lecture over an introduction to science fiction, or what we'll be studying specifically is dystopian literature. Over the next several slides, I'm going to introduce you to the purposes and characteristics of dystopian writing, some famous texts, a discussion about dystopian themes and the dystopian protagonists, and all of this will set up our fourth and final unit of study for this semester. First of all, when we're talking about science fiction, I've encountered that many people kind of have a stereotypical image in their mind. They think S Star Wars or some intergalactic kind of setting, but we really need to be clear on what it is exactly that we're talking about. Yes, we're talking about topics that are imaginary, but all of this content and situations are very plausible. These writers are talking about um, something that could be happening in the not-so-distant future. And all of the texts that we'll read together will specifically look at how accurate a lot of these authors actually are. These authors explore the consequences of many things in our life today, such as science and technology, and how, according to some authors, our technology is progressing at quite a rapid pace. So this writing is very rational and looking at the possible outcomes and worlds and futures of our future if things continue to spiral out of control. But in order to really kind of grasp and understand this, as this fourth bullet kind of talks about, we have to have what's called a, a suspension of disbelief. We have to put our logistics to the side on what current life is and really dive deep into what these authors are talking about to explore the truths and their possible warnings about our futures. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at what a dystopia is. It, like the name conveys, is the opposite of a utopia. Utopia, this ideal perfect place, but a, a dystopia has a, quite a parody of it, um, looking at the opposite side of it. There's a, an absence of personal control. People are controlled through some kind of corporation, bureaucracy, technological invention, or totalitarian presence. Government is often a huge character in these stories that control the citizens and erase personal identities and personal control. And as we kind of talked about earlier, is exaggerated worst case scenario. So if you think of a satire as trying to blow out of proportion or show extremities of a topic, that is what dystopias are doing. It's trying to exaggerate to kind of catch your attention about some current truths. Here are some famous dystopian texts. The three on the right are the ones that we will look at in this unit. 1984, written by George Orwell, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, and we will begin with Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. All of these books were written in the 40s and 50s. On the right, these three texts are more contemporary and current day texts. Cormac McCarthy's The Road, Suzanne Collins' The Hunger Games, and Veronica Roth's Divergent series. So through The Hunger Games and Divergent, it shows you just how this dystopian genre is still very popular today and these are only six of a quite large list of dystopian texts. We'll also talk about in class and even view some dystopian movies and how key movies like iRobot, The Matrix, and other movies really pick up on this dystopian trend. Here are the characteristics of a dystopian society. Number one is the use of propaganda. Um, these characters' lives are inundated by this act of persuasion around them through the television, through billboards. D propaganda really dictates a lot of their, of their life. And it comes from a figurehead or person that is in charge. And most of these people are worshipped by the citizens of the society, most often f forcefully or through a series of brainwashing and physical force, these people are worshipped. Lives for citizens are constantly surve surveilled, either in their houses or out in society, um, through some new technological device. And people are, are fearful of the outside world. In lots of these texts, there are quarantined areas. The boundaries of the world and have been redrawn. There are often places of exile, of older days or the ancient days, which when we look into these texts, are the lives and the um, kinds of lives that we're living today. Um, and society is an illusion to a perfect utopian world. So what we call society and mainstream has been redefined. 
Other characteristics that we really need to focus on is what is the issue currently that the author is looking at being responsible for a changed future? Because that's what the author is really trying to talk about. We're really going to study author's purpose in this and what is the purpose of Bradbury and Orwell and Huxley and their writings. What are they trying to convey to us before it is too late? And the reason why those three texts are, are still so popular you know, 40, 50, 60 years after being written is because their predictions came true and we're living them now. And in the case of George Orwell's 1984, written in 1948, the world of 1984 came much quicker than people actually did expect. The idea of isolation and the role that nature plays is huge. Um, nature is an important character of sorts and really comments and builds various different aspects of the book. Also, the climax of these stories is important because sometimes the storyline is unresolved. The hero fails. Um, the climax is an anticlimax. Things build up and then fall back down again. Because in a dystopian world, it's not truly a dystopia if things are then turned into a nice orderly state like they used to be. So keep that in mind as we read. On an earlier slide, I mentioned the dystopian controls those who are in charge, and here are your four major types. Some kind of corporation, that, again, going back to this propaganda that controls people through products and advertising and the media. And we're going to talk a lot today about the role that media plays in our 21st century lives because it is and has a huge control and persuas persuasive effort in our lives. Bureaucracies, you're looking here at the different regulations and rules handed down by the figurehead or those in charge that take things away from people or require what we would consider inane or crazy daily requirements or laws to uh, uphold. If you can think of the movie V for Vendetta, if you've seen it, the movie End Time, the way that this bureau 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 bureaucratical control really changes the day-to-day -day life of normal citizens. Again, technology is huge, and you have to think about when these books that we're studying were written in the 40s and 50s, Technology was nothing like it is today, but the way that they predicted the future would be, it's kind of scary how similar it actually is. And you're looking at the philosophical or religious control there, often enforced through a dictator um, looking at themselves as a religious figure to be worshipped. The protagonist in these stories is very important. Um, there's something that's a little bit different about your protagonist. He or she does not fit into the mainstream. Um, they question life. They, they see that something's just not right around them, and that sparks some kind of awakening or curiosity. It comes with these feelings of being trapped and being unhappy. They question the things around them, kind of go with their gut or intuition, and they then turn into a rebel. And it's supposed to be as a kind of spokesperson for the audience to really kind of guide the audience to the author's messages and arguments to really pay attention through that by then going along through the perspective of the protagonist. In one book, for example, Brave New World, your protagonist switches halfway through the book. So we're not looking at the same kinds of um, traditional styles and structures of books as you maybe have accustomed to. Here's a pretty extensive list of common dystopian themes. Some will have more importance in some books than others, but they're all seen in some sense to the three books that, will be, that we will be reading. From censorship, um, controlling what people read and are allowed to say, the battle between being knowledgeable and ignorant, really kind of look at the cliche of ignorance as uh, bliss, mass media and propaganda, this notion of conforming versus the sense of individuality and people's search for identity. With the arguments for technology in these stories, the idea of technology as a distraction, um, then it's supposed to look at the quality of life people are leading due to the distractions and technology around them versus what is truly responsible for one's happiness. People's action versus inaction, people acting on their beliefs in order to do something and how not acting is an action in itself and trying to see how these protagonists motivate others around them to kind of rise up and support them. Science and technology are two huge catalysts for these stories that were huge 
um, in the 40s and 50s and 60s as that kind of rapid growth in those fields really boomed for one of the big first times. Social status is huge as social classes and structures and ranks are redrawn. And then lastly, law and justice, these protagonists out to create some kind of downfall for those in control and seeking justice for those who are responsible for their dystopian way of life. Here are two quotations, one from Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World, and Albert Einstein. What I want you to do is to look through both of these quotes and look at the arguments that Huxley and Einstein bring up. And I want you to kind of jot down not only your interpretation of the quotations, but give us some proof that these authors are on to something here. So study them for a little bit, jot down your thoughts, think of some proof for us to kind of see what these authors are talking about. And this will be a great introduction to what we're going to do in class with these texts.